You're muted, Jeremy. Okay. All right, uh, my name is Jeremy Wells and I'm the Interim Historic Preservation Program Director here at the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And the Marvin Breckenridge Patterson Lecture was established in 1998 through a generous gift from Mrs. Patterson to support an annual lecture on current issues in historic preservation. So we're very happy to be the beneficiaries of this generous gift to be able to do this lecture here today. But before we start um, our uh, session today um, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, Sarah Bronin, I wanted to provide a land acknowledgement um, from our geographic perspective here at the University of Maryland. Every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to migrate from their homes and hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. Here at the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those who have been historically and systemically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to the Piscataway elders and ancestors Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Magallo, who is currently a presidential postdoc scholar, but will be joining us here in the school um, as an assistant professor in the fall. And she will be introducing our speaker today. Hi everyone, welcome. And um, I am proud to introduce our Breckenridge um, uh, lecturer today, our guest speaker, uh, Sarah Bronin. Sarah is a Mexican American architect, attorney, professor, and policymaker whose interdisciplinary work focuses on how law and policy can foster more equitable, sustainable, well designed, and connected places. She is a professor of the Cornell College of Architecture, Art and Planning, an associated faculty member of the Cornell Law School and a faculty fellow at, of the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. Among other visiting positions, uh, Sarah has taught at the Yale School of Architecture and at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And she has been vi a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania Kleinman Center on policy, Energy Policy and the Soborn. Among other scholarly service, Sarah is an elected uh, member of the American Law Institute and a past chair of the state and local government section of the American Association of Law Schools. And so without further ado, I am pleased to present to you, Sarah Broden. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Dr. Magalong, for that wonderful um, introduction, and Dr. Wells for inviting me today, and for all of you guys for being here. I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully you'll be able to see it clearly. I tried to put, this was my minimal uh, words, maximum pictures presentation on the topic of today, because I feel like it lends itself to that. Um, and so the title is The Hidden Power That Shapes Our Historic Places. And what I'm really gonna talk about today is zoning. Um, so I was really delighted to be asked to, to give this lecture um, given its place in the University of Maryland's um, uh, the, the academic year. And um, hopefully this will provide some food for thought and I'll definitely look forward to your questions. I'd also like to recognize, I see a couple of folks in the room from Hartford, including Lynn Ferrari, um, who knows more about Hartford and its history than anybody else uh, on the planet. So um, please direct your history questions to her um, if you don't mind. Okay, so with that in mind, um, what is zoning? And I'm sure most of the people on this call know exactly what it is, um, but just for those who want the succinct definition, 
uh, I always say it's the regulation of land uses, structures, and lots. So zoning frequently takes place on the local level. Of course, it always takes place in accordance with state zoning enabling acts. Those laws tell local governments how they can exercise their zoning powers. So there is a state local um, uh, interchange uh, exchange when it comes to zoning regulation. So I'm going to get right down to the question of the day, which is how does zoning impact historic places and how can historic places benefit from better zoning? So again, many of you have probably thought about this or you've seen individual instances of zoning uh, negatively impacting historic places or potentially positively impacting them. But I thought I would focus on four things today. Um, so one is flexibility in uses and the ability of zoning codes to uh, enable that. The second is the form of structures and how zoning regulations can uh, add to historic regulation um, or uh, replace it um, and by regulating on the basis of structures. Um, the size of lots, I'll touch on that really briefly. That is a much uh, more, um, uh, uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a, perhaps a simpler issue. And then finally, the treatment of cars which is something that I've often thought about and um, hopefully you will too after this. So the focus of the geographic nature of the presentation is gonna be Connecticut where I'm beaming in from today and, and Hartford specifically, it's capital city. And to orient those who have not been in Hartford recently, um, I thought I would first provide a map of this city it's bordered to the east by the Connecticut River, and it's only 18 square miles, so it's pretty small, but it has a large number of historic districts. Um, if you look on this map, you can see, if you can read the fine print on the right, um, there's about 25 uh, different uh, districts uh, on the National Register. Uh, there are also state historic districts and local historic districts. And I'll give a little tidbit for those whose states don't allow local governments to regulate National Register properties, uh, but Hartford uh, and other uh, New Britain and uh, maybe other cities and towns in Connecticut uh, use local uh, historic district regulation to also regulate state and National Register properties. So all of these um, designated sites on this map uh, all do go through the Historic District Commission. So here's an image of uh, uh, Bushnell Park, the oldest public park in the country, the state capital, which is where we're located today, um, which is where, where, uh, where, uh, where um, of course, Hartford is. But I want to just point out this little brownstone right here in the center of the image is actually my house. So uh, you can peer into my windows from this image. Um, you can see, and I'll just point out on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the vast parking lots that surround the state office buildings behind uh, my house. And I'll talk a little bit about those when we get to the treatment of cars. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that we do have uh, from the image from where that pic last picture was taken is downtown, which has buildings up to about 38 stories. You can see a couple of those in the image in the bottom left. Um, we also have um, a minor league baseball stadium that has uh, hopefully uh, become a positive for the city after being built a few years ago amidst some controversy and drawing development um, northward from downtown. Hartford is also known for its park. So I mentioned Bushnell Park. Here's another image of that park in the top left, Elizabeth Park, the oldest rose garden in the country, an image of the Connecticut River on the top right, and then even the Park River, which is a little bit more wild um, on the bottom right. So these images are meant to give you an idea of the Hartford that started uh, in 2016 to uh, really starting a few years before that 2014 to undergo a rezoning process and this process was a comprehensive rezoning um, unlike many cities around the country who might do piecemeal rezonings um, Hartford looked at the whole its whole zoning code and decided that it was time to uh, update it in its entirety and for good reason uh, the code was very outdated and um, had in it uh, concepts uh, that like servants and um, really a, a very backwards looking approach to development. 
So some images that you see on the on the right. So this is the cover of our zoning regulations as showing another image of downtown Trumbull Street. And then uh, folks who are conduct are, are undergoing image preference surveys on the top right. And then I guess there I am talking to a group of business owners uh, during the, the zoning process. Before I move on, just on those image surveys, you may have participated in zoning processes in your own town. And what an image survey is, is it shows you images of usually buildings in your town and asks you which one do you like best. And uh, in our case, almost universally, the buildings that people like best were the charming historic buildings that typified Hartford's, uh, um, I would say, early 20th century uh, to mid, mid 20th century time frame, or late late 19th century too as well, because we have very historic buildings here. Um, very few people, if any, chose the gas stations and fast food restaurants um, that uh, whose urban form has problems for other reasons. We'll talk about form a little bit more in a moment. But first, I want to talk about the flexibility of uses. So as I mentioned, zoning codes uh, govern the use of uh, every uh, inch of land within the jurisdiction other than state and federal land and other exempted lands. Um, here's that image of Trumbull Street again, where you can see that mix of uses coming to, to light. Hold on one second. Um, there's a restaurant on the ground floor, retail space beyond. Um, there are offices and in some cases residential uh, above these. And so you, you see here historically, especially this building, the building in the background um, and the white building with the red awning in the foreground, um, that these are places that were built, uh, in fact, to have mixed uses because you wouldn't have retail shops going all the way upstairs um, and uh, were also built to um, the, um, I guess, the, the, to, to engage the pedestrian at that street level. Here's another one of our historic streets, again, uh, emphasizing the historic nature of construction in urban areas and, and the emphasis on mixed use that the buildings themselves display by the very nature of their construction, uh, where you see glass on the ground floor, you see, again, pedestrians while walking around. Uh, that street has now been closed to cars, at least temporarily, um, for people to enjoy the shops around. And yet another image of Albany Avenue, uh, which has, uh, this is an old image of Albany Avenue, actually the streetscape has been improved, but you can see here again, um, the buildings on the left, uh, speaking to that mixed use nature. Oh, and then a, a conversion here. So, so let me talk a little bit about the zoning's role. So, so when we redid the zoning code, um, in many cases, we found that um, residential was not allowed on those upper stories in commercial areas. And we also found that there were lots of places, including uh, our numerous historic industrial sites all over the city where residential and other uses were not allowed. Um, our code anticipated that these manufacturing type uses would one day come back to life as manufacturing uses. Um, of course, if you've been around preservation enough, you know that that's very not likely to be the case um, for these uh, types of um, facilities and buildings. Um, here you see a, a building that is one of my favorite rehabs in Hartford. Um, it was a deteriorating factory for about um, totally abandoned for many decades. Um, and it was renovated for uh, mostly residential use and, and amenities for the residential. Um, and it was really beautifully redone. I probably should have put a before picture in here. But it, envisioning and enabling larger historic sites to have a variety of uses is something that only the zoning code can do. And unless historic preservationists are actively engaged in that aspect of zoning, you may find that it's less viable for projects to be rehabilitated because of the fact that they have to go through zoning entitlement processes without a certain result. Uh, here's an image of an interior of another building, uh, a, um, a mid-century modern tower that was rehabilitated, uh, formerly the Bank of America building, uh, from, so from office space into residential. Um, now, this building was rehabilitated before the zoning code went into effect. Um, it had to go through uh, some uh, public hearing processes and also to provide some um, amount of parking. Um, but what we tried to do with the zoning code was, um, and you'll we'll talk about parking in a minute, so hold that thought, 
But what we tried to do across downtown where this building is located is uh, to enable all kinds of conversions from uh, historic buildings, including office towers that have been uh, unfortunately um, uh, not abandoned, but uh, you know the office market has has not been great in post-industrial cities like Hartford. Um, so allowing these buildings to be converted to residential or other uses uh, is really important. The kinds of uses that we allow in um, downtowns and, and other areas across the city um, are residential, um, commercial, retail, um, clinical offices, um, but importantly, we also allow for craftsman industrial uses across virtually every neighborhood in the city. And what that means is that if somebody wanted to go into this building, even if it was mostly residential, and put in a couple of floors of space where someone could reignite uh, that manufacturing ethic that Hartford had once um, 100 years ago, um, and a little bit today, um, they could do that. Um, so, so our zoning code is intended to enable and allow that kind of development to happen, um, usually without any public hearings whatsoever. For housing across the city, uh, we really made a commitment to enable as of right housing, as of right zoning across the city. Just one moment. Okay. Um, I wanted to point out that Hartford's uh, position in this uh, um, is actually really different from the rest of the country. So you could, uh, the rest of the state rather. So you can see here that Hartford, uh, which is in the top middle, is part of a state with 169 municipalities. Uh, it uh, uh, is one of about seven larger cities across Connecticut, and it is one of the few places that allows housing uh, to be developed as of right. This image is an image from the Connecticut Zoning Atlas, and I'll drop a link in the chat um, to uh, a, a paper and, and the atlas itself showing how housing is allowed across the state. Um, it's a research project that I started through um, another organization I won't uh, be talking too much about today, but it's called Desegregate Connecticut, which is a uh, pro-homes coalition of about 80 nonprofits that has uh, so far successfully advocated for state level zoning reforms. But in any case, this map um, shows uh, in purple the amount of land that is devoted to single family uses. This map shows you how much land is um, allows for four or more family uses as of right. And again, it's shown in the purple. So you can see that Hartford in its context, it's only at 17, 18 square miles. It uh, is one of the few places along with New Haven, New Britain, a little bit Danbury, um, Montville, Norwich, um, that actually allows for multifamily housing as of right, um, which is problematic from a, a, a general equity perspective. Um, but it's also problematic for historic places because uh, the more kinds of uses that we enable them to uh, uh, have, uh, the more likely it is they'll be able to be rehabilitated. So uh, in Hartford's case, I would say uh, to summarize what we did on housing um, and to create that flexibility of uses for historic places, uh, we enabled uh, lots of more diverse housing options. We legalized accessory dwelling units, which were illegal before um, the zoning changes. So an accessory apartment, I'll show you in the next slide, um, but uh, is, is a unit of, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, oh, oops, there it is. Um, uh, it's a unit of housing that's uh, smaller than uh, the main unit, but can be developed in the same lot. Um, again, those were not legal in Hartford, and I bet um, they're not legal in many of the cities where you're located, but yet they're the most important um, mechanism for uh, homeowners to stay in their homes and they generate income. Um, so we also uh, touched on home occupations, enabling people who um, uh, wanted to create uh, cottage food production uh, in their homes to be able to do that without uh, creating any additional zoning permitting and also loosening up home occupations in other ways. I should have probably mentioned at the outset that Harvard is a predominantly minority, um, a fairly low income city, usually one of the most low income cities in the country, according to the census. 
So here are some examples of those diverse housing options. We have lots of triple deckers. The image on the bottom right shows Hartford's perfect six, which allows six units of housing. Uh, they were built that way. So you go up the main stairs and then you branch off at each floor uh, to six buildings. Of course, our factories, that's, that's an old image of, of cold. Um, it's been rehabilitated since then, but I wanted to uh, toss in a couple of old and news. Um, and then on the top left, there's another factory called Billings Forge that has a restaurant uh, and uh, um, food production facilities, as well as apartments and other amenities. So I've talked about ADUs already. I think they're a really important way to uh, promote both housing and also preservation and reuse of uh, historic homes. Again, many in many communities uh, that you probably live in, there are large historic homes that uh, with six bedrooms or more that uh, might be better suited to have some kind of accessory use associated with the accessory home associated with it. Um, so zoning is the only way that that can happen because zoning tells you what kinds of uses you can put your historic homes to. All right, so that's a lot about uses. I thought I would talk a little bit about the form of structures. Now, this is going to be familiar to some of you, too. Um, looking at how uh, we did this in Hartford uh, might be of interest. So uh, specifically, I want to talk today about uh, form-based provisions in zoning codes. And there's a lot to say about form-based codes. And I'm sure many of you have comments. I'd love to hear them in the Q&A. Um, but in general, we thought that a form-based code would be good for Hartford because it provides clear design guidelines, meaning that you know what you're going to get at the end of it. So the public input in the beginning of the process enables for faster permitting uh, of desirable uses like more housing um, at the end. Um, we know that form-based codes can be drafted to be compatible with historic places because they address issues like scale and bulk and um, at placement on lots and so on. And again, they can fast track as of right development. And that's really where we focused in Hartford. So we had a consultant um, uh, from Codometrics, a Chicago-based firm, uh, come in and do this massive study of Hartford's current building stock. Uh, here's an image of Park Street, uh, which is a uh, vibrant neighborhood main street that is uh, in, in uh, really cutting through the center of Hartford, actually um, west to east. And uh, you can see here, there are uh, two and three story and four story buildings. Um, most of them are historic. You have some civic buildings. Um, many of them are located close to the street. Uh, you do have, so, you, so talking about the building scale, you have a mix of uses. Um, you have entrances that typically front the street and they're storefront style entrances. Um, so when she cataloged these uses, she not only did the commercial areas, but, but also the outlying areas. So here is, um, I would say, the, the perhaps the grandest neighborhood in, in um, Hartford with its gigantic homes on large lots, um, which she called those in the initial draft, the estate form. And you see that here. And, and looking at the, the um, way that these buildings are situated on a lot, you can see that there are rules that you could write into a, a zoning code that would permit this kind of development. And there are different rules that you would use to permit this kind of development. You would talk about where the building is located um, on the lot, how tall it has to be, how much space you have to be around it, and so on. Albany Avenue is just another example of the kind of analysis that was done, looking at uh, the mix of Main Street uses here in solid black, uh, commercial uses uh, just in industrial uses here in the dashed areas, residential uses in between, and trying to figure out if there was a logical way for us to write a code that enabled all of this to fit together. Um, in, in, in summary, after looking at all of these uh, and block by block, uh, building by building all over the city, um, she came up with and we developed uh, this list of about 14 different building types. Um, each of these building types reflects existing historic structures in Hartford and also provides flexibility for new construction to be done in a way that's not just cookie cutter, exactly um, uh, 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 anticipated by the zoning code, but uh, where there's built-in flexibility to the code. So the district types that we had, uh, downtown, commercial, industrial, 
main street, multi-use, flat out industrial, neighborhood mix and neighborhood districts um, all, all have assigned to them different building types that can be allowed. So really the mixed use and non-residential districts on the left tend to have more of the storefront style buildings, the um, civic uh, buildings, the workshop and warehouse buildings and the industrial zones, the buildings, uh, the, the districts on the right, the neighborhood mix and the neighborhood districts are more like the residential and apartment districts. And so the types of buildings that are allowed there are different. Just to give you an example, here is a page from our code. This shows the downtown storefront building type, which has that um, those uh, um, glass fronted uh, first floors. And here is the house type B, which is the most common building type in Hartford. Uh, these are examples from all over the city, North End, South End, uh, West End. And they follow a somewhat of a pattern, although they're very distinct uh, as you look from one to the other. They have two and a half to three stories. Uh, they have pitched roofs. They have entrances in the front. They're built up not exactly on the street, but not as far back as you saw some of those quote unquote estates. And so again, here you can imagine ways that you can write rules in the zoning code. And just to show you in case you haven't seen a form-based code, what it looks like, here are some uh, two the following two pages of that house type B. You can see here that there is a building line to which each house must be built. So in other words, instead of thinking about a setback, outside of which the, the uh, housing must be built. Uh, there's a build two line. Um, we have as a minimum and maximum height between two and three stories. Now, why wouldn't you want a one story house in a neighborhood full of these guys? Um, probably because you would know right off the bat that that's incompatible with what's around it. Similarly, uh, the permitted roof type here, is, it's uh, more strict than in most districts. It's a pitched roof. We do have some flat roofs that have popped up in, in neighborhoods where you have this house type B, um, but it looks out of place. And so in the new zoning code, we said, well, uh, if you're gonna build a new house here, if you're gonna renovate uh, an old one, um, you need to keep that pitched roof or you need to put a pitched roof in. And again, it doesn't say, doesn't specify the orientation of the pitched roof. You can see two orientations here along with a little turreted thing here. Um, but it does say that that is really the, the design uh, characteristic that typifies this neighborhood and for new construction uh, would help to ensure compatibility. So just to give you a, a, a hint about how this uh, works uh, in how the zoning code has worked in practice, when the zoning code was adopted, um, here's a map of historic district around uh, in uh, one of the neighborhoods, West End. And you can see here that, that one street, Oxford Street, is kind of left out of the designated historic districts. And again, this was at the time of adoption. If you look at these, this one street, Kenyon Street, that was in, in the historic district and that's regulated by the local historic commission, and the next street, Oxford Street, they're pretty much indistinguishable in terms of building quality in terms of um, uh, type of building. I'll go back to Kenyon Street and back to Oxford Street. So although Oxford Street has now been incorporated into that district, um, the, the zoning code enabled for, um, for a uh, district that was historic but not yet encompassed in the historic district regulation to be treated through zoning um, in a way that very likely the historic commission would also enable it to be treated. Um, in other neighborhoods, larger buildings are allowed. So here's an example of a recent uh, building construction, uh, construction of a, actually a multi-building um, neighborhood that has popped up in a former housing authority site uh, in the North End. Um, and you can see here the kind of development that we are hoping to avoid with the new code. This was pre, pre, pre zoning code uh, revisions that by the way, the code was unanimously adopted in 2016. Um, and if you're a good preservationist, you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. So certainly there has to be a combination of uh, historic protections and zoning regulations, especially for our buildings downtown, which are mostly now protected um, to avoid things like this. But um, this is pretty, uh, pretty bad. Okay. All right. So just to, to zoom back out, I'll try to zoom back out in Connecticut and all of these. So Hartford has done a form-based code. Other cities in Connecticut have done one too, mostly for specific neighborhoods. Um, we just met this zoning reform effort that I mentioned 
um, passed a law, helped to pass a law last year that required the state to uh, adopt a form-based code, a model form-based code that municipalities could then draw from. And I bet that when that when the state actually develops this, many states uh, in New England and maybe beyond can tear pages right out of it and um, and take them for themselves. All right, so just a quick note on the size of lots. So the uh, Desegregate Connecticut Zoning Atlas, um, it, which was really shocking to me and very interesting, was that uh, we found that across the state, 80% of residential land requires an acre or more of land. If you think about, if you look back at the downtown images, virtually every Park Street, Albany Avenue, virtually every image that I showed you of historic areas, uh, you could see relatively small lots, um, other than the very large estates that I that I showed you, um, relatively small lots, even for the house type Bs, um, but certainly on commercial main streets, uh, you did not see the kind of setbacks. And, and that's the kind of development, as I said at the beginning, that people who were doing the building preference surveys uh, imagined as, be, as gravitating towards. So in Hartford, we don't have a minimum lot size um, that we have other things that help to uh, ensure that the street face is uh, somewhat uh, harmonious, for example, that build to line that I mentioned, and requirements that buildings occupy a certain amount of building frontage. Uh, but in terms of lot sizes, uh, we eliminated those in our, our, our code revision. So I will say this map is shows uh, not just um, large lot developments, uh, large lot zoning in um, in rural areas like you might find in the Northwest or Northeast Connecticut, it also shows large lot zoning in suburban areas. So this has significant environmental effects because as you push development outward, you, uh, it, you require one lot to have essentially a football field almost um, per house of land. Um, you're, you're pushing turf and grass and streets and infrastructure outward into farmland and forest and Connecticut is lost um, six and a half percent of its forests, including five and a half percent of its core forests, um, between 1985 and 2010 alone, um, it's also lost uh, a big chunk of its agricultural land because primarily of residential sprawl. The other thing that's important for historic places, and you might think, well, why are you talking about this? You know, lots of these places, there's no historic buildings out in out in the forest. Um, but what um, zoning uh, uh, policies that in, embed residential sprawl into everyday development do is they push development out of those core historic Main Street areas that so many of us work to preserve. So unless you put housing, unless you zone those areas for housing, my first contention, and unless you change where your zoning code is directing housing by pushing it inward where places that are already developed can benefit from new residents as opposed to outward, which has really negative environmental and economic um, and um, equity impacts, um, you, you're doing a disservice to your historic places. So this lot size issue, I'll put just a, a, this in your head to say this, this really is um, actually a historic preservation issue. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so proud that Connecticut's um, three statewide preservation organizations uh, which are Preservation Connecticut, Connecticut Preservation Action, and the Connecticut Main Street Center have all enthusiastically supported zoning reform. And in fact, we just did a panel last week, I'll, if I remember, I'll put that in the chat too, um, with the Connecticut Main Street Center about the importance of zoning in creating walkable places that support historic rehabs and historic um, activity. So then finally, in my last few minutes, I want to cover uh, zoning and the treatment of cars, because that is uh, a really important uh, issue that more preservationists should get involved in at the local level. Here are some images of Hartford. Again, you have Pratt Street, now closed to cars in the bottom. Uh, you have our, we have a, a bus rapid transit system called the Connecticut Fast Track that actually has designated stations leading out to uh, the southwesterly uh, suburbs. Whoops. Um, we have uh, we have tried and, and are, need to do more, uh, but it, putting in bike and, and walking infrastructure around the city. Um, we do have an active bike culture uh, here, and I wish it was bigger and safer. Um, but to the extent that zoning can play a role in this, 
we thought that uh, one of the things that was really important was to ensure that bikes could have places to park on the lots which were being rezoned and being developed. And so uh, drawing from Cambridge, Massachusetts's bike parking requirements uh, through the zoning code reform, we also instituted bike parking requirements. Now, again, what does this have to do with historic places? If you create infrastructure for people who bike and people who walk, you, especially around historic main streets uh, and small areas where there are small businesses, you increase traffic to those businesses. Um, more people take shorter trips, more people uh, stop in and uh, park their bikes and walk than they might uh, with a car just driving through. So uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure is actually really important for preservationists. Uh, also through the zoning code, we tried to ensure, and that new development uh, that I showed you, uh, the, the image of the building of, also uh, is proof of concept uh, for our street design uh, profiles, which we include in the last chapter of our zoning code. Not typically covered by a zoning code, uh, but something that we felt was really important um, to help guide the Department of Public Works, as well as uh, future subdivision developers, like the one redeveloping the Housing Authority site, um, to ensure that they, uh, uh, through their street designs, enable a mix of uses. So here's one, um, Fitzgerald Halliday was uh, the uh, developer of these uh, images and an important partner in our effort. All right, so those couple of things aside, street design and bike parking, I wanna talk about uh, the issue that I think is most important for preservationists uh, in zoning, and that is parking. So zoning codes across the country require minimum parking requirements for every use, minimum car parking requirements. So they might say, for example, that an individual apartment needs two parking spaces or a retail shop needs uh, three parking spaces for every 1000 square feet. Uh, in both cases, oftentimes the park, the, both of those examples, oftentimes the parking that's required is bigger than the use itself. Um, the reason that um, parking is um, important for uh, historic places, uh, historic preservationists, is that parking requirements have resulted in your town, I guarantee it, uh, historic buildings being torn down so that a next door building could satisfy parking requirements. Um, they also thwart the reuse of places. Uh, in other words, they, um, because of parking requirements, you might not be able to convert a building from one use to another because you cannot on your same lot uh, now um, uh, host the number of parking spaces that the zoning code requires. Parking spaces are not, uh, minimum parking mandates are not uh, uh, something that is that are uncommon. They're extremely common. The zoning atlas in Connecticut revealed that 87% of land in Connecticut has minimum parking requirements. If there is one thing I would change across all of preservation and zoning policy, um, and I could wave my magic wand, it would be to get rid of parking requirements. I think that would be um, really good. So in Hartford, we actually did get rid of parking requirements. Uh, we started downtown in 2016, and then in 2017, we completely eliminated them citywide for every use, um, except for car sales lots, which need parking for the number of cars that they're selling. Um, so other than that, there are no minimum parking requirements, and instead there are parking maximums. So you can see here on the right, uh, uh, for example, um, retail uses, you cannot provide more than three spaces per 1,000 square feet. Uh, we hope you provide none because if you provide parking, more people drive, research has shown that. And if you provide parking, you detract from street life in your community because you have curb cuts, you have uh, asphalt, you have urban heat islands, um, and just in general, you make your community worse. Here's an example of a building on the left in downtown that had no parking associated with it on the lot and was handily approved without a public hearing for conversion from office to housing under the new code. Oh, this is a rather grainy image, but um, just one last thing I wanted to say on um, the uh, cars um, and, uh, and zoning. Um, communities, including Hartford in this purple area, have also rezoned to allow for denser development around transit. So I mentioned the Connecticut fast track stations, these little uh, very blurry red stars show you where the fast track stations are and the hot purple shows you where we've rezoned for transit oriented development. 
which enables in the western portions of the city development uh, equaling uh, downtown. We're hoping through Desegregate Connecticut this year to uh, pass a bill uh, at the statewide level that would enable uh, zoning uh, to be uh, to have to allow for uh, across all of these towns with transit stations, either train or Connecticut fast track stations, um, to allow for 15 units per acre, which matches a Massachusetts law that recently passed. So we've been excited to be recognized for some of this stuff. Um, this image here on the top left shows exactly, and uh, this is from 2016, exactly how desperate um, we are to turn our parking oriented um, uh, reputation around. This whole site here, if you, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in the middle left of that uh, image on the left has now uh, become uh, the stadium, a stadium as well as a uh, hundreds of units apartment building, and that will, um, at least in theory, help reconnect downtown, uh, which was bifurcated from the north end with this um, very um, destructive highway. Um, and we're excited that we've attracted breweries and and other things. Of course, the pandemic's put the hold put a hold on some things, um, but uh, we are where we are. Uh, we've also been recognized for because of the zoning reforms and other activities that it's a bike friendly and a walk friendly community, a soul smart gold community. I haven't talked about how our zoning code enabled um, renewable energy as of right in every zoning district for every building, but I'm happy to talk about that too. Um, and you know, generally our sustainability focused uh, uh, zoning code, which also includes green uh, um, infrastructure provisions to so stormwater management requirements, um, as well as electric vehicle charging stations and lots of things, um, the kitchen sink of environmental zoning regulations. And again, happy to talk about those. So I think I'm gonna stop there to allow for uh, questions and comments. And uh, this is my Twitter handle. I'm always happy to connect with you there. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I invite folks who are joining us to, if they'd like to have any questions, they can add it to the chat. And I know, uh, particularly as often, um, parking is always the thing that gets people asking questions. <laughs> And so initially we had some, uh, Barbara Little asked the question in terms of, well, what about disabled parking? If you're saying to, you know, to eliminate the parking requirement. Yes, yeah, cer certainly we've, we've heard that too. And, and there are of course, disabled uh, members of our community who, um, who use cars. Um, it, we found that through the advocates on our, um, the, the advocates for the disability community on our desegregate Connecticut coalition, that their main issue is actually not um, car access, but um, the fact that many don't drive cars and that they don't have walkable places that they can live. So uh, certainly there's a balance um, for um, uh, to provide that kind of parking and access for the disabled community who does need uh, to use cars. And there are ways to do that through on-street parking and designations of on-street parking uh, for, for exclusively uh, exclusive use by disabled drivers. Um, but uh, I would say that from what we understand, the needs uh, in the disabled community um, more geared towards uh, the need for differently designed communities as a whole, as opposed to de demanding more um, uh, parking infrastructure for their cars. Okay, great. Sorry, everyone, my internet's un unstable. Um, any other questions? And uh, I know there's a question from Deborah asking, we are uh, recording today's um, presentation and we will have it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, it will be on the, um, the School of uh, Maryland School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, our MAP uh, YouTube channel. So you can view it there. Yeah, that, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. And so um, any other questions for Sarah? Sarah, I, I have a question for you as a former Californian as an Angelino, um, you know, uh, there's the state bill that the governor passed on um, state bill nine, which has now allowed for, you know, um, duplexes to be built out and, and uh, across the state. 
And I was wondering what your 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 thoughts were on the California State Bill Nine. Yeah, so California is in an epic battle, as we all are across the country, to address a housing shortage that has resulted in um, really dire situations um, nationally. That's true in Connecticut. Uh, certainly, I'm sure it's true in Maryland and, and definitely in California. So the bill uh, and a number of bills that have been passed in California have attempted to um, take that state level authority that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk there, it's enabling authority to allow local governments to zone and to use that authority to help guide local government decision making um, to create a pro homes uh, environment. Uh, right now, there are so many different barriers to housing production in California, probably I would say the, the most barriers to housing production um, in, in of any state. Um, and so these countermeasures that have been uh, going through the legislature recently have attempted to, to, to overcome that. So that bill is one of a series of bills. There's um, bills uh, that have pa been passed in Portland that have also allowed for up to four plexes, so four units in single family areas. Minneapolis has rezoned to allow that. Um, in Connecticut, we haven't pushed for um, that kind of change at our in our state, uh, mostly because we're we sort of started from scratch last year on the zoning reform conversation. So we um, last year legalized accessory dwelling units, did the form based code. Actually, we did uh, pass uh, parking caps. Um, uh, there are an, another uh, a number of other provisions, uh, including on cottage food following Hartford um, and and on uh, fair housing um, principles generally that were in, uh, imposed uh, that were and in, in passed into the law. And I'll put a summary of that law in the chat. Um, but California's law, I mean, I would just say the particulars um, are. Um, are, are something that many states have looked at. We haven't in Connecticut yet, or we haven't pushed that yet um, because we're just behind. But um, at some point, we're going to have to do some pretty major things to address uh, the national affordable housing crisis. And zoning is one of the most important tools because without zoning uh, being straightened out and enabling housing, you don't get um, housing. It's the barrier. Um, I see an, a, a question here from Sarah in case uh, your internet is frozen. Uh, Sarah Scott, how can we consider historic preservation and efforts to legalize multifamily housing? Should I answer that one? Yeah, sorry, Sarah. I, I don't know if someone's gaming upstairs and I have <laughs> no, no shaky problem. internet. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll help you field some questions then, uh, yeah. if, if, as I see them. Um, so the involvement of preservationists in housing legalization is has not been more urgent um, than it is today. Unfortunately, we see instances um, in of no one on this call, I'm sure, of, of some people using preservation as um, a as a rallying cry against new housing. And if we continue to do that, um, it will be not only problematic for our movement, but it'll be um, it, it potentially, um, actually it could, it could lead to our overall demise as a movement because we will turn off young people who are seeking housing and who cannot afford it, people who need housing policies to change and who are actively working on those. Um, and uh, preservation will be seen as really a not in my backyard, um, obsolete, um, operation. So I think if preservationists are involved in housing policies um, and thinking about them at the local level, and again, that's not something that I, at, at the advisory council, uh, it's not in the advisory council's purview. So this is more just like a general, a general comment here, um, just to say that um, unless preservationists start to go into zoning conversations with something to offer, with ideas about how historic places can be reused for housing uh, from both the, the small scale and the scale of the individual old drafty house who needs a, 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 a rehab, maybe an ADU to help uh, it survive and to help to justify uh, economically its, its rehabilitation according to the, the property owner, all the way to these really large industrial sites that have not been um, looked at uh, through zone, a zoning lens to enable a, a flexibility and a mix of uses. And then combine that with um, the preservationists 
really pushing on parking reform uh, as a tool to help to protect protect historic buildings uh, from demolition, as well as to enable their reuse for more uses, um, because parking restrictions, as I said before, can constrain our ability to convert um, historic places to new uses. So I would say we should get into the conversations um, at, the zoning, at, at the zoning boards, but we should be providing solutions as opposed to some of the things that we've heard, uh, again, no one here, um, but it have been done in the name of preservation. Thanks, Sarah. And Marina has asked this question, speaking of zoning, have you rezoned former industrial zones to allow for mixed use, including residential? Yes, so so virtually everywhere in the city that has um, uh, uh, it, uh, an old factory is uh, has been rezoned for a variety of uses. Um, much of them have been rezoned for residential, others have been rezoned because of just where they're located for office and um, craftsman industrial and uh, food production workshops and things like that. So they're, they're definitely moving beyond um, the, uh, they're beyond the purely industrial function. Um, I, uh, thanks. And then there's a question from John Spinkle. Is Connecticut a Dillon state, Dillon rule state? And how would this impact uh, progress in zoning changes? Yeah, so so uh, the questioner is referring to the um, the uh, general rule that uh, many states, are, although increasingly less so, have adopted um, that speak about a local government power and say that where um, the state has not expressly given a local government its power, uh, a, a particular power, they can't do that. Zoning is a little bit different. Um, so because zoning authority comes from the Zoning Enabling Act, um, courts, I wouldn't say that they don't, certainly they don't ignore Dillon's rule, but they, um, uh, the Zoning Enabling Act is I, virtually identical in all 50 states. So the way that courts interpret local government's authority to zone uh, tends to be pretty similar, uh, even if um, and jurisdiction is within uh, Dillon's rule state. We did hear a lot of um, discussion last session when we were promoting zoning reform about local control of zoning. And, you know, if you look at the maps um, that we developed and the, the um, and through the Connecticut Zoning Atlas, uh, though it, it was pretty clear that it was local governments that needed to update their policies on land use. And so fortunately we were able to convince the legislature um, who had long considered um, some of these uh, issues that we had brought to um, the fore again uh, last year um, that they should vote in favor of change. Okay, wonderful. Oh, uh, we have, oh, do we have Brennan? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm at Brennan, would you like to add? Yeah, I'm at Shenandoah National Park. The, um, one of the things that, that I've noticed is that um, when, when it comes to property values, commercial and industrial properties, the, the land value actually outstrips um, surrounding parcels. So it makes it very difficult to back, back the, the, redevelop them as residential because you're essentially asking the landowner to kind of devalue their property. So it, it, uh, is there any progress on incentivizing that type of redevelopment so that the, the core of, of redevelopment intensifies rather than extend, extends out, you know, because that's the, the model from the, from I guess from the 50s on forward has been extensive devel development rather than intensification. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm not certainly not an, an, an expert on that particular issue. So I think I'm going to have to punt. Um. We have some wonderful questions here in the chat. Um, thanks for asking your question, Brennan. And um, I think Blair Davenport, her question is, does the form-based code address or consider historic landscapes, including appropriate plantings? Yes, so there's a, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So chapter six of the code deals with landscaping and um, the requirement, uh, there's a, a lot of provisions there about specific kinds of trees and native landscaping and 
Um, it also bans artificial turf uh, from being used in the city, both for its negative health effects as well as its uh, negative environmental effects. Uh, the runoff that uh, crumb rubber creates into our waterways is um, not desirable. So um, the, the landscaping provision, it doesn't address historic landscapes in particular. Um, if a landscape is designated historic and um, is proposed to be rehabilitated or changed, it would go through the historic commission. But the code does, I, I, I think, look to the, the natural um, landscape and take cues about what kinds of things should be permitted um, from environmental management best practices. Okay. And um, Renee Erickson has asked, in areas where structures have been removed for parking, is there encouragement uh, to build parking structures on the land that complement the historic style of the area? Yeah, so we um, it, it, certainly, if it, people want to pool their resources, and property owners want to pool their resources and put a garage up somewhere, that is a win win for everyone. Um, the city's parking authority has been considering different uh, ways to do that, including on Bartholomew Avenue, where um, a uh, movie theater, uh, school, uh, at all old factories um, converted uh, to these uses, lots of residential um, uh, have all, uh, and, and some other arts oriented mm -hmm. uses, um, have, uh, been, uh, have parking needs that can be met with a garage. Um, so that's certainly an issue. We do allow for, in limited circumstances, parking garages to be built downtown. However, the design provisions on those require that there be a three-story building um, with a 30-foot depth, I believe, um, uh, on the street. So in no instance will Hartford be seeing a new parking garage that does not have that building requirement because we do not want any more um, emphasis uh, in our city on the infrastructure that we require for these, um, these cars to, in, to dominate our city. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sarah. And I apologize to Deborah, Caroline, and Sarah Burks for not being able to answer your question. But um, I wanted to close out. I know we're almost at the top of the hour, and I know Jeremy has some some closing um, housekeeping to talk about. So I'm going to pass it on to Jeremy and thank Sarah for for answering all these wonderful questions. Right. Thank you, Michelle. So. Um, so if you remember from the original um, announcement for this lecture, there's a workshop that goes with it. And so we need to give our wonderful speaker uh, a bit of a break uh, to recuperate for the workshop that she's going to be leading, which is going to be exploring different ways uh, that local preservationists can engage in advocacy activities. But um, I want to uh, very much thank um, uh, Professor Bronin for her excellent exploration of the intersection of zoning and preservation, uh, well needed topic. Um, so uh, it is at the hour now. And so uh, there is a planned 15 minute break. And so we will uh, start up again at a quarter after 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, where again, Professor Bronin will be able to uh, start with the workshop, workshop section of this particular uh, lecture. So, um, Everybody is free to um, stay on the line um, and, and come back ready to engage at 1.15. Um, or you can leave and you can come back. You can still use the same link to come back into the particular session. So um, with that, um, please enjoy your break and uh, we'll see you in about 15 minutes. <laughs> 